Welcome. I'd like to tell you about the LC circuit. An LC circuit is a circuit that has a capacitor and an inductor in it. And um, we're going to assume there's no resistance in this circuit. Okay, um, let me just go over it with you what's happening then inside of an inductor before we start. So in an inductor or a solenoid, when you have current in it, <clears throat> if the current is changing, if you have a changing current, that means that the field inside is also changing. Remember the field inside there, right at the center, is going to be equal to mu naught times little n times i. And so it's dependent on the current. And so that if you change the current, you change the uh, magnetic field. By changing the magnetic field, you're also changing the magnetic flux. And we know from Faraday's law that if we change the magnetic flux, then we induce an EMF at this rate. And in a previous video, I showed, this is Faraday's law, part of it, and I showed you that this goes to this. So the when you have an inductor. And so um, L is inductance, and if I is changing with time, then you get this EMF that occurs. Okay? Well, um, you need to understand then that when I changes, you, whenever there's an, a changing I in here, this tries to resist the change in, in, in that current and by inducing in itself a, an EMF. <clears throat> okay, let's um, say that we have a capacitor here and it's charged Q0. Um, it's a capacitance C. And um, let's say that um, the inductor is, is an inductance L. And I'm, if I close this switch, um, I want you to see what happens here. When I close this switch, these charges rush around to negate the negatives on the other side. I know that it's actually the electrons that go this way, but I'm going to um, use the conventional flow of current. So the charges zip around. Now, you might think that they do that almost instantaneously because this is just a wire, a bunch of loops of wire. But when you close the switch... When it goes to set up a current, when it goes to, when this starts to move over there, this acts like a battery pushing this way. <coughs> so it, it's resisting the, the change in current. Um, the, and so at first, the, uh, the, it doesn't just zip over there and, and get neutralized. It takes a moment. But once it gets set up, once the current gets set up, you might think that after a moment it would just die out because once all this charge got over to here, then wh why would we have current? But as soon as it starts to die out, as soon as this current that is going this way starts to die out, well now this is going to try and stop the current from changing by pushing it that way. So not only does this resist the, the current this way, but when it goes to die out, it resists that current that current dying out and so it actually charges this positively that that, that battery is going to actually push so much that it charges that positively <coughs> at that point this thing comes just comes back around and does the exact same thing in the other direction and so that that's why you get this sloshing of charge in here it just sloshes back and forth and the rate at which that sloshes back and forth has a lot to do with um, the the how much inertia it has, how much electrical inertia it has. The more inertia, the more electrical inertia, the longer it takes to slosh back and forth. And the bigger the C, well, we'll talk about it. All right, so um, we're going to use an anal uh, mechanical analog here. This is very similar to a mass on a spring. When you go to um, pull a mass back, you put energy in it, the distance A, and you let go, and this thing shoots by to, be, to return to equilibrium. But in so doing, because it has some mass, when it gets to here, it's got, it has inertia, and it has velocity. And so even though there's no net force here, it's got some velocity and inertia, and so that just carries it right past where it was trying to get to. It's almost like a cartoon or something where the 
you know, the, the object's trying to get by there and then it realizes, oh my gosh, I'm already to the equilibrium position and, and, but you're not going to be able to stay there because you have too much inertia. So it's going to zip back and forth, zip back and forth. Well, same thing with this. But the period of this is equal to 2 pi times the square root of m over k. Well, I'd like you to see that we're going to get, for every formula here, we're going to get a formula here. So the so over here, the period is going to be, I, I have not derived this, but I just know that um, the analogs are the mass is the is mechanical inertia, L is rotate is um, um, electrical inertia. Now um, K here is analogous to 1 over C. So K is like 1 over C. That's the one kind of tricky analogy. And so the period for this for this is going to be 2 pi times the square root of m, but m is L over k, and k is 1 over c. So as you might guess, that comes up, to, that just turns out to be 2 pi times this, the square root of lc. So if you want to figure out just how long it's going to take, <clears throat> the period is the, the, dist the time it takes for this to go all the way to the opposite side and come back to its original position. The period of this is how long it takes to go from being positively charged on this side to negatively charged on that side and then back to positively charged. That's one period when it goes back to the charge that it had before. Okay, um, We can talk about the frequency. It's going to be 1 over the period. So the frequency of this is going to be 1 over the period or it's going to be um, 1 over 2 pi times the square root of k over m. And the frequency of this is going to be 1 over 2 pi times the square root of 1 over LC. Okay, so um, when we go to make a circuit like this that, that has this resonant frequency, we can change the rate at which it goes back and forth, the, the electron slash back and forth, <coughs> the frequency of it, just by changing L or by changing C. So, um, in fact, when when you go to tune a radio, if your radio is made of a capacitor and an inductance coil, you can either change the L of the, of the inductance coil, or you can change the C of the capacitor. And there's different ways that you can do that. Okay, um, let's go on with this, with all the different equations. Um, as you might remember, for the for the mass on a spring, it's um, it's moving. Uh, we can say that x, its position at any time is maybe a times the cosine of omega t, and this is assuming that you're starting at um, x equals a, at time t equals zero, you're starting at a. You're starting all the way out here. Well, the same thing with this. Um, the, the analog for X, what did you do to put some energy in here? You pulled it back. You gave it some stretch. What did you do to get this started? You had to give this some Q. And so the Q is analogous to this. So it's going to be Q is equal to Q naught times the cosine of omega T. <clears throat> so um, remember with omega, I'll tell you about omega in, in, in the next video. This, this is going to be a two video um, topic here. So um, velocity for the mass on the spring, you just take the derivative of this. So it's going to be negative a omega sine omega t. And um, What's the derivative of q with respect to time? This is dx dt. dq dt is, um, it turns out that dq dt is i. If you take the derivative of q with respect to time. And so that's going to be um, q naught times omega <clears throat> times the sine of omega t. So this right here 
that's probably going to be I initial. Okay, so, uh, but that's, I'm sorry, that's going to be the maximum. That's not I initial. I'm sorry about that. That's, this is, this is the maximum A right here. This will be the maximum I. Okay, I got to go. I'm out of time.